am Sandra Leiderman, and this is Kelly Cheney. We are both master teachers at UALR Teach, and UALR Teach is a secondary education program uh, focused on STEM majors, so math and science. Um, currently, I teach an entire semester class on project-based instruction, and I try to cram everything into about a 30-minute presentation. I hope that I am hitting all the good points, um, but along the way, any questions you have, if anything's not clear, any anything, um, just feel free to ask. We're going to start out with a video. Okay, so if you're a math teacher and you're about to start linear equations and graphing, a little more fun than, hey guys, take out your math books, you know, and you, and you start doing all the stuff on the board or you 
present them with a problem and a challenge that they need to develop those skills to be able to use, uh, to be able to solve that problem. And that's ex essentially what project-based learning is. It's um, a student-centered approach. It works at a long-term problem or um, challenge. And, um, By the way, if you're not fam familiar with emails, um, let your kids use it. It's an awesome alternative to PowerPoint. There's so many different templates and animations, and um, kids absolutely love it. But, uh, okay, so student-centered approach for working an extended period of time, um, solving a problem, solving a challenge, and presenting it to somebody other than you as the classroom teacher. So um, in, our, in our traditional classroom, and this is actually how I got started in project-based learning, is you do your typical lessons, activity, lesson, activity, activity, and then at the end we're going to do a project. And we take all of that stuff and we maybe make a poster, or we do a presentation, or you know something creative, which is great. Um, in my sixth grade math class, I started with a virtual vacation. And we used percentages and ratios and all of that, and we put it all together. And then I just had to make a poster for it. And you know, then I was like, well, what can we do that's more? So I took that same principle, but this time they designed a brochure and they had to market their vacation. Why was their vacation the best for, for the budget? So they could choose different price points and um, you know, they had to pick places to go. They had to do a lot of research on that stuff. But you know, everything had to be you couldn't spend more than 25% on lodging or more than 10% on food and, and you know, so bring everything out that way and, and was it an all-inclusive? Did it include all the meals or is it just airfare? And so we really took a look at using all those math numbers, but then, you know, when you see an advertisement and it says, oh, go to Jamaica for $199. Oh, wait, that's $199 a night for the hotel. That's not the whole thing. So it's, it's learning those. Um, real world things. So just doing your activity lecture, homework, activity, and turning it into a project is not necessarily project-based learning. Um, it's, it's a project at the end of a traditional unit is, you know, because the knowledge didn't come from the students while they're solving this problem, technically we don't call it um, project-based learning. There's generally no outside connections with that, so we don't bring in guest speakers, we don't present to anybody else. Um, and they don't see the value in it. If, you're, if you have outside speakers come in or you have them presenting to maybe the school board or maybe an engineering firm, all of a sudden their, their level of engagement and importance of this project step up a little bit versus, oh, we just gotta present to the class and I'm just gonna get a grade on it, who really cares? Um, it also allows for meaningful content and to be able to master 21st century skills, those technology skills, those presenting skills. Uh, but the, the biggest thing um, I like to say, and uh, it's, it's not an encore performance, it's, it's not the end of a concert, it's the concert itself, in that the entire project is that, that move. So a concert project, if we look at it, it teaches essential content. We all know it's standards-based. We all have standards we have to hit. So we need to make sure that it's content-based. Um, it's organized. You, as the teacher, you need to kind of organize the steps all along the way. Um, but the biggest thing is that it creates a need to know. The students need to know this, all of this information. They need to know those linear equations. They need to know the graphing, or they're not going to be able to design a water park. They're not going to be able to present that if they don't have the skills to solve the problem. Um, and then, of course, it requires inquiry. We definitely want project-based learning student-led, and that's where, as a teacher, you maybe have little activities along the way, um, you kind of guide them, oh, well, did you check out this website, or did you talk to this person, or did you call them? And they're doing all the work, and you're just kind of guiding them along the way. But it's all inquiry, student-led, um, while they look for, for the answers. Um, and then, of course, student voice and choice. 
you got to give them some options. Are you going to make them just all do a public presentation? Are you going to make them all do a commercial? What other options can they do? Can they design a, a brochure? Can they, um, you know, make an email presentation? Can they do a commercial? Can they, you know, so how many different learning styles can we hit with this one thing? All using the same qualifications, but what's your end product? Give them some choice and voice in that. Uh, definitely promotes the higher order thinking. Um, revision and reflection is huge, and that's where as a teacher you have to keep giving them feedback early and often. Let them re redesign, re you know, change things, rethink how they're learning. And then the biggest thing is a public audience. You know, like I said, if, it's, if you present to the classroom, they look at it as a grade. If they're presenting to a school board or an engineering <laughs> firm or city council, all of a sudden it has more meaning to them and, and they'll step up the, the um, outcome. And if you'll notice, we've been mentioning, you know, making it meaningful and, and different things that whenever you were in your theory classes, these were all what the theorists were telling you worked in the classroom. But what we find is when we go out and watch our students, a lot of times they tend to fall back on those methods that they were taught because those are the comfortable methods. And so through this process, we're getting our students to kind of step outside of their comfort zone which is then influencing the teachers that they're working with to step outside their comfort zone, because that is kind of what this is. It is something that we don't do every day, that a classroom teacher doesn't do every day. So it does make you feel a little nervous the first time you step into it. So problem-based learning, student-centered instruction solving real-world challenges. And that's, that's where we have to make it real. Are you designing a swimming pool? Are you designing a brochure? Or maybe doing something with alternative energy? Um, I think I have maybe examples on the next one. No, mm -mm. <laughs> Project and problem-based learning. Um, very similar, but different. Project is an extended time. It's um, multifaceted. There's a lot more steps in it versus a problem-based where maybe it's just a day or two or, or even a week. Um, but you can see the similarities here. They, they're all um, authentic, they're open-ended, um, they're student-centered. And then some of the biggest differences here, kind of having color-coded project-based, you'll see in the blue, versus problem-based. Um, and this is probably the biggest thing is in a problem base, you're giving them a case, a case study or a scenario. You, you, something's already done for them um, that they have to solve versus um, in the project base, it's real world authentic. You know, you've been hired as an engineer to design a new bridge and, and it's got to, and you give them all their constraints and everything in there um, versus a problem would be, you know, Susie and Brad went to, I don't know, they were going to take everybody out to eat and they realized they didn't have enough money, what should they do? You know, it's, it's those problem, uh, story problems. Mm -hmm. um, doing project-based is a little more difficult than math, and so you'll see a lot of it, a lot of math is done problem-based, which there's nothing wrong with either one, um, because they all have those, those things, but, um, you know, so the case study versus real world, the time period, um, Normally in, in project-based, they're creating a presentation to present to somebody versus in problem-based, they're, they're writing out their answer, they're explaining, and it's kind of those open-ended, uh, open response questions. So for an example of um, a project that they could do, we have uh, a space on the campus of the high school where I used to teach that always was muddy. Every time it rained, that, that caught the runoff, it was muddy. It was an eyesore, it created a hazard that kids had to walk around. So the question was, what are we going to do to fix this? And it's great that you can, could uh, bring in the social studies department because they then went through, if there's a problem on city property, what are your, what is the procedure that you go through in order to be able to present this to the city government? So they were involved not throughout the entire length of the unit, but they were involved for a piece of the unit. And then they could use uh, the drama department to help them as far as presentation skills so that students weren't just standing there reading and they didn't do that. I mean, how many times <coughs> when your students make a presentation, you see this going on? Yeah. And they don't even know that they're doing it. 
whenever I film myself, I find that before I say something, I go, and then I talk. And my students this year caught it just like that. So you bring in the drama department to work on kids' uh, little tells that are the problem there. But then we also had math involved in how much water is this place actually <coughs> collecting and how much do we need to move off. But at the end, the students actually had to present their plans. And I, I'm friends with one of the members of the city council. And he came and actually listened to their plans. Nothing was ever done, but <laughs> they were good plans. Right? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, so biggest thing that people say is, OK, where do I begin? Where do I start doing a project or problem-based unit? And of course, as we know, <coughs> standards are important. So that's where we, have, where we start. No matter what course you're teaching, you know, K-8 science, math, whatever. Find your standards, find your unit. <laughs> it's okay. <coughs> and then, what is your driving question? What is the essential question? What do you want them to do with all that knowledge? Um, how much money would be saved if we used the form of alternative energy at our school? How can we create a public service announcement, announcement for TV showing why the Constitution is still important today? <coughs> How can we design a better cardboard sled? Um, you know, uh, design your, your perfect bedroom or design a house to be sold. I think that's where we, yeah. These are some that, that I've done in my class. Um, we did the dream bedroom and they, um, they learned about scale and budget and all of that. Then they took their technology skills and, and they created it on paper. They did a 2D floor plan and then went to Google SketchUp for the 3D plan, and then they had to present that um, you know, to the homeowner. Okay, I'm the contractor, and this is what I designed for your bedroom. You know, hopefully, they, they would buy that. And of course, the, the prepaid vacation, um, doing the brochure. The alternative energy analysis, that one was really cool, too. Uh, like I said, they took the, we got all the energy bills from the district office for our school, and our school had three different buildings, and the students could choose all three buildings, they could choose just one building, and then pick a form of alternative, alternative energy, um, and, and so it was solar, wind, but they were actually calling these people, like, how much does it cost to install this, how many would I need to, you know, this is the energy use of this building, so how many solar panels would I need, and they put together the whole presentation. I actually even had one, one group so we had this big empty field behind us um, between our school and then the, the learning academy behind us. And they created this like self-propelling hydroelectric. You know, it started with a rain basin catching it and it would go downhill and then paddle and then uphill and, and that was gonna generate the gym so that they could have air conditioning in the gym. Um, but we brought in um, the, the building director of the district and uh, a couple of the superintendents brought them into the classroom so that they could present their findings to them. And, you know, of course, it's a big cost up front to change over to any alternative energy and it's years down the road. So as we know, that never happens in public schools, but it was a great experience for them. And then um, probably one of the favorite of the eighth graders is the cardboard sleds. And, and of course, you know, we're the last week of school and everybody expects you to still learn. Kids don't want to learn, but we turned um, cardboard sledding into a science lesson. So we learned, you know, we remembered about friction and the forces. But then um, their design wasn't just make a cardboard sled and let's go sledding. They actually had to see if they put a coating on that cardboard, would it actually make them go faster? So they could use plastic, wax, paper, whatever they wanted. I had one group bring in the big contractor garbage bag and they covered that and then they put turtle wax on that garbage bag. And um, you know, it worked the first time, but then what they found was that the grass would stick to the turtle wax and, and it didn't actually work as well as they thought. But um, you know, just a whole lot of different creativity on trying to overcome that friction and weight because the, the sleds had to be designed to hold two people. And you know, two eighth graders can be an awful lot of weight or a little bit of weight. And, and so it got that discussion going, well, yeah, but two, two people, but what weight limit, you know? And it would be like, well, you know, I mean, if me and Kelly go, that's a whole lot different than if, if I have to be stuck with this guy, you know, and you've got the six foot tall eighth grader and they're like, mm -hmm. So a lot of discussion, a lot of learning went on in a simple fun project that we did get to take out to the football field and slide down the hill in the end. 
Um, so you want to go with backwards design. That's the easiest way. So you start with your standard. What's your driving question? What project? What am I going to have them do? What do I want them to do with that? And then you kind of make out your calendar, you know, at checkpoints. And that check, that calendar um, can work for you and it also works for them. So it's checkpoints for you. This is where we need to be so that we stay on task. And then um, the students also get that calendar so they know, oh, well, we have to have this, this piece done by this or this piece done by that. And then, of course, your final presentation at the end. Um, so the project calendar is, is huge. That's a necessary component of PBI. So you've got to make sure that you have that. Uh, this is an example of one. So it can tell you, um, you know, what you're doing on Monday, the skills that are needed, the process skills that you're going to learn, uh, that you're going to have the students learn, and then what activity they're going to do. Um, so, you, you know, when you're looking at this, okay, so now you've got your project, right? And you're like, okay, we're going to do this. All right, now let's back up one more. What skills do they need? Do they need to know the linear equations? Do they need to know how to take temperature? Do they need to know, I mean, obviously presentation and technology skills? And how am I going to incorporate all this and on, on what given day am I going to be able to do that? So having that project calendar is huge. And then, of course, don't forget the technology. Um, Project-based learning is, is essential for building 21st century skills. And, of course, technology fluency is definitely um, in those 21st century skills. And then of course you want to have fun with it. Um, I'm sure there's a whole lot more questions. There's a whole lot more that, that we didn't touch. Is there anything? I mean, I see a lot of people writing stuff down. Like what else do you what else do you want to know? What do you uh, yes? Um, the Buck Institute, BIE, is huge in project-based um, instruction. I actually refer a lot of my students to that. What is it? The Buck Institute, it's BIE.org. And uh, just a lot of design elements on there. Um, there's, there's project ideas on that website, but it'll also, you know, how to do a calendar, how to do this, how to do that. What are the essential components that need to be in, in your project-based unit? was the website again? Buck Institute. So it's B-I-E. I think it's Buck Institute Education, but B is in Buck, I-E dot org. That's actually the index that is the PBL in elementary schools, which is so much different than any other. <laughs> yeah. So it's been great. It's wonderful we went through that with our staff, and it's awesome. Yeah. So that's exactly what you were presenting on. <clears throat> Walk you through how to plan and how all those things. Exactly. Fabulous. Yes. But also, at least they did it recently, they offered a downloadable rubric for your product in order that you're designing your PBL right. uh, outcomes that you can use that rubric. Yeah, so kind of get that checklist. Do I have everything? Am I doing this right? You know, and one of the biggest things is as a classroom teacher, you're like, oh my god, I can't do this. Uh, nobody else is doing it. What's my principal going to say? There's only two people that need to give you buy-in. One is yourself and the other one is your principal, because you're not going to be doing things the standard way. And, um, you know, the school I worked at last year, she would come into my classroom and she'd be like, well, why are the textbooks still on the shelves? You haven't even opened them yet. And I said, because I don't do textbooks. And, you know, it, it was really foreign to her that, that I didn't teach with a textbook. I don't. I, I taught for five years and never used one. Um, except for the kid that you had to put in the corner, you know, and then you take out the textbook and then they're like, oh, I don't want to do this. Um, but you, you got to talk to them and you say, okay, we're going to try something new. I'm going to do it here. You know, this is my plan. And make sure your principal's on board with it. And after that, I mean, that's really it. You don't have to have a whole school initiative to do it. Um, obviously, it's way cooler if you do because you can get, you know, the social studies teacher or the English teacher. But even on a small project that you just want to do in your classroom, ask the English teacher, hey, you know, can you show them this? Or does this, you know, I know this is an English standard, you know, can you include that in your classroom? Or maybe you can give them a grade for it. Give them, give the students just a little bit more value for the entire project that they're doing. But there's absolutely no reason that you can't start, start small, start with one. Just, just do one in, in, you know, maybe the first or second nine weeks and keep it small, maybe two weeks. 
and just see how it goes. And then you can start you know, adding on to it and making it, it bigger from there. A um, ton of different websites out there, even if you're just looking for a project and maybe not looking for the whole unit, but what are some ideas that I can you know, use for um, cells and biology or the periodic table or atomic theory? There's um, tryengineering.org or teachengineering.org. They've got a whole bunch of activities and lesson plans and everything on there that it may not be the whole unit, but it's like, oh, we could do this, and then if I added this, this, and this, now I've got a whole unit. And um, I mean, just a ton, a ton of resources out there. Well, and what I would hear from teachers that I taught with, because I taught in the high school level, was, oh, that's something that they can do on the elementary level, or that's something they can do on the middle school level, but here on the high school level, we can't do that. Because, I mean, elementary, yeah, y'all do, uh, many elementary teachers work collaboratively together, and middle school usually is in teams, and those teams work collaboratively. But at the high school level, we walk in our classroom and shut the door, and we are the power of one. Well, you can make yourself be the example of one, because if you can't have anybody else jump on your wagon to do PBI, you can still do it within your classroom. And what people will begin to notice is that your students are talking about your class. And they're not talking about it as in, oh, Ms. Cheney's making me do this again. But they talk about it excitedly. And that gets people's attention. So I encourage you to be that agent of change in your school. And don't, don't think, okay, every unit I teach has to be PBI. Every, I've got to have it just in, embedded in my program all the way. Just try it every once in a while and see what happens. And it may be something that you say, I'm, I don't want to do this. This isn't for me. But it may be that one thing that makes your students shine above all others and that gives them that little edge on those standardized tests because they have done the explain. They have uh, had to come up with a persuasive argument so that when they do those writing prompts, they've done that. It's mm -hmm. just second nature to them instead of, okay, now I've got to do a persuasive writing uh, prompt. I've got to you know, think back to what that is. Kuzina? How many of you have done project or problem-based units? Good, good. And the rest of you are wanting to or? Yes? <laughs> Would some of you that have done that share out a, a, one of your favorites or something that really worked well? Well, we 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 started last year. We planned one. Okay. So in our grade level, and so we just looked, we used the Bethany Student PBO for elementary until we didn't really know what we were doing. Right. Um, so it was very helpful. But so each grade level. Um, created one, and so like we've had a broadium, like the fourth graders have been doing um, one that says too cool for school rules, and so they uh, they did a video of me, and, and I just presented it for the entry event to say, oh my goodness, I need your help, we are having some behavioral problems in different areas of the building, I need you to gather data on where it's happening, and what can we, you know, we've got to get a better plan, da da da. So they were like, so excited. They thought, I mean, they're important now because they're fixing to help with behavioral roles. Right? <laughs> so, but they had their, I mean, like the teacher um, organized it and, you know, they went to different places of the building and got their data. And now they're putting everything together to propose a plan of action. And so, you know, that's in the works. Um, my third grade team um, was doing um, a science one that connected to a walking trail in our, in our community. So last Friday, we loaded the bus, and we took it to the walking trail, and they were able to investigate the habitats and um, the, the, the trees and the plants and the, you know, the organisms that were there. And then they're going to do QR codes, and we got with the mayor, and he's going to help give us, you know, give us the materials to, to make it the walking trail, and they can have information on it. Um, our kindergartners, because that was the challenge of kindergarten and first grade. Uh, but they're doing a whole group with um, how to, the kindergartens how to be a better friend, and so they actually put together different skits and got to be the character and, and That's video, awesome. video that stuff. So yeah, it's 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 been a great journey to watch and watch the engagement level. And so it's what been school fun. Are you at? I'm at Greenbar West Elementary. Really? 
you know, you usually think about really innovative projects being the school, the big schools you hear about. No, Greenbrier yeah. has just jumped in. It's excellent. It is. I mean, in, in my experience with it, I taught at Fuller Middle School right here in, in Little Rock for <coughs> four years, and um, it's a very high needs, high poverty school. Um, I'm going to say our last count before I left was about 85% free and reduced. And so you get that mentality like, okay, these kids are all so low, and we have the low socioeconomic, they're just not capable of thinking. And I mean, I just started it, and two years later, um, we had a whole bunch more teachers buy in to it, and we are a STEM school of excellence from the International STEM Education Association. So even in a high needs, high poverty school, it can be done. It's all in teaching the kids to think and teaching them what they need to do and, and how to stay on task. And, and yeah, I mean, to start with, especially with, with you know, eighth graders that might only be on a fourth or fifth grade level, you gotta, you gotta step back a lot and, and do a lot of guiding. But that's only on the first one. And then they get it after that. And then they know where they need to be and what they need to be doing. And you just see a whole lot more enthusiasm for coming to school and coming to class. And you know, um, like I said, we had three buildings. And so they would come from the far building over to my classroom. And there's only four minutes in between. But they were running to line up outside my door because they were like, well, I only came today. It's an A day. But I have STEM today. So that's the only reason I came is because I got your class. You know, that's, that's the kind of things that we want to hear out of them, is that they're excited that, oh, of course, I'd love them to come for other reasons, but hey, if it got them there for the whole day because they had my class that day, then that's awesome, then I've done something right. Are there any other projects or problems? I'm sorry. Yep. Hey! Sorry. <laughs> um, I did a project uh, with fourth grade uh, last year. I started small. Uh, used the 21st century. They have a website that has different projects on there. And we decided to do a brochure for Southside Elementary. And with the brochure, um, the kids, it was so student-led. It evolved on its own. We kind of gave them that guiding question, and then they went with it. Um, in the end, they did um, create an actual brochure, QR codes. It was all done on the Chromebooks. Printed them all, um, presented them to all the elementary building um, principals, some of the school board members, That's those awesome. types of things. And so it was really nice. And what they started doing is seeing the history of Southside. And so then we found old scrapbooks and stuff. So they started trying to find what important information they wanted to put on the brochures. And now we're using those brochures to hand to our new families that come into the room. That is really and I'm glad you mentioned that because whenever you start a project like that, you're going to find that the community wants to be involved, and that's such a I guess I should stand <laughs> that's such a big push now is to get that community involvement in your school. Mm -hmm. Yet we have questions all the time. Well, you know, I, I don't get parents to come to open house. I don't get you know the community doesn't want to come on to campus and do stuff for us. Boom! You've created that opportunity for people to come up and go. Well, I went to school here, and here are some pictures, and here are some artifacts. The, the original principal that opened up the building came and, and spoke with the kids about it. Um, which is awesome. Yes, it was amazing. And then the flexible scheduling, which was really nice, because it would do team teachers, one land, one, or math, science, social studies, one land, and arts, and they would just kind of flux their schedule and flexible to what the students needed yeah. at that time, depending on where they were. Yeah, and I mean, when we did our alternative energy, I actually had the architecture firm that designed this building. Um, they came 